Uh, you were a couple slides, but I don't know if you want to clear it. Okay. Yeah, we can go back a little bit. All right, yeah, we can review what was going on with the mail a little bit before we start. What we did last time was we talked about some of the um, major anatomy from the mail. So we know that in the seminiferous tubules, What's the production of? Sperm. Sperm, that's right. Spermatogenesis, guided by which hormone? Anybody know? FSH. FSH guides the development of sperm in the male, right? And guides the development of what in the female? Just think of the name, FSH. The follicle, right? It matures that one follicle every month for the female. Whereas LH is more in control of testosterone in the male and estrogen in the female. So those LH and FSH come out of where? Anterior pituitary guided by hypothalamus, gonadotropin releasing hormone, right? Okay. So we'll see a little bit more of that at the tail end. But yeah, in the male, seminiferous tubules guide the maturation of the sperm. Then they lead into the epididymis, right, to mature, to fully gain their ability to swim. Then they come up the vas deferens. They pass over the pubic bone around the bladder and join in with the what? Anybody remember? The seminiferous tubule, right, to form that ejaculatory duct in the prostatic urethra, right, and then we get, travel through the small urogenital diaphragm. So have that, try to have that, you know, that mental picture going on, because that's how it is on the test, you know, with just words. Then as we come into the penis, it's known as the what urethra? Spongy urethra, because the urethra is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. Right, okay, perfect. So I'm not sure how much, um, I know we, we did all this pretty, pretty well. You said there was a couple of blanks? There is one blank. This one right here? Yeah. And that would be the prostatic urethra. This is explaining where the junction between the seminal vesicle contribution, which is about 70% of the semen, that's a good thing to know. 70% of the semen is seminal vesicle fluid. And most of the other 30% is going to be what? The prostate, right? Y'all are looking at me like you either really don't care or <laughs> <laughs> did we really cover this or am I really here? <laughs> About 30%. I can go back to that slide real fast. I know we saw it somewhere. Oh, we're all the way back to the beginning now. Maybe we just didn't. There we go. There's seminal vesicle, 70%, and the prostatic. Oh, it didn't give a percentage. I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. One third. So that's about the same thing. Okay. So remember, even with um, the male getting, you know, a vasectomy, what are we doing there to the vas deferens? Just cutting it or tying it off. We're stopping the mature sperm from getting into the seminal fluid, right? But there's still an ejaculate, the fluid, but there's no, or there should be no semen in it, right? Or excuse me, no sperm in it. Okay. <laughs> I'll never forget the day Dr. John walked in my office out of the blue. And you know Dr. John, right? Maybe Dr. John Azevedo? Out of the blue, <laughs> he asked me, do you want to know the difference between uh, ejaculation before you're fixed or after you're fixed? And I'm already shaking my head no, because <laughs> I really don't want to go on with this conversation. <laughs> but he sits down and starts professing to me the big difference, because I guess he was, you know, had a vasectomy on it recently, I don't know. <laughs> it, so I won't, I won't go into all that discussion, but that day I'll never forget. <laughs> he, 
once you're engaged in a conversation with Dr. John, you know, you're pretty much committed to a, you know, a talk. <laughs> but he's an incredibly smart guy. He just, you know, sometimes goes off on little tangents, <laughs> and that was definitely one of them. All right, so getting back to the female anatomy. All right, so the major things we're going to look at, of course, is the uterus. The neck of the uterus being the cervix leading toward the birth canal, which is the vagina, the external anatomy, the labia, major and minor, basically there for protection. The clitoris, the same erectile tissue that will be found in the penis, is the clitoris. So in early embryological development, um, we actually are a little bit looking like all female, right? And then the male, the cells proliferate, what would normally be just clitoral tissue, it proliferates into the penis. So it is the same tissue, really, as far as erectile nervous system tissue. Okay. There's no other really, uh, there's a couple of things, maybe ligaments we can look at. The round ligament is one we'll talk about where it prevents antiversion. So you see how the uterus normally sits kind of forward? Well, imagine a uterus with a baby in it, an embryo, right, growing. You don't want that uterus to completely fall so much forward, right? So the round ligament helps to prevent antiversion. It kind of holds it back, holds it up a little bit to prevent complete antiversion, which would be falling too much forward. And the uterosacral ligament, not so important, but we'll see some other ligaments in, a, in another picture here. The uterus itself, the body is the major portion, the fundus, of course, being the upper rounded region just like kind of like in the stomach. Here is the ovarian ligament. What does the ovarian ligament do? Basically just tethers the ovary over here toward the uterus. And then we have the broad ligament. This kind of blends in with the, with the mesentery. It basically just covers all the female anatomy like that, the female reproductive anatomy. Then we can see the obvious fallopian tubes, also called uterine tubes. The ovaries will eject the egg, of course, once a month during ovulation. And what happens to that egg? Where does it go? Picked up through the fimbria, right? And carried through the fallopian tubes toward the uterus by way of what kind of movement? Cilia. Yeah, the ciliary, right, the cilia inside the uterine tubes. And what kind of epithelium do we have in uterine tubes and uterus? Simple columnar. Right? The muscle, of course, would be smooth muscle. Right? We see the round ligament again, and then the ovarian ligament, and then the broad ligament. That's about all the anatomy. The only other anatomy I would really ask would be about the cervix. Just locating the internal os and the external os. Basically, the inlet toward the uterus and the outlet right here of the uterus. The cervix, if you've not heard this, you know, being just considered the neck of the uterus like cervical. So you can imagine when that hole dilates to 10 centimeters, right? What does that mean? It means, <laughs> yeah, pain is, pain is already there, of course, but pain is really about to visit <laughs> as we squeeze a fully developed baby through a very, very small birth canal. That is unreal. You guys really deserve a trophy. More than a trophy, maybe a I don't know, a thousand dollar Starbucks card and a one million dollar government check for being a mom. It's a never ending job. <laughs> okay. All right, so the cortex of the ovary is where we're going to see these eggs um, have their follicle and be developed once a month. We're getting to that. And the medulla is where primarily blood supply is. The ovary, just like the testicle, surrounded intimately by the tunica albiginia. So there is that in common. The ovary, very similar like the testicle, surrounded by this tunica, like a full fibrous capsule there, tunica albiginia. All right, let me, um, let's go ahead and jump in to uh, meiosis a little bit before we even get further with the fertilization. Let's see where this is going. Okay. 
We'll, we'll cover the ovarian, ovarian cycle pretty much last. All right, so I brought with me today some handy little Q-tips. Not Q-tips, what do you call these things again? Life creams. Life creams, there we go. To kind of indicate what's going on in meiosis. If you've looked at the handout, you've seen there's some primary differences here between mitosis and meiosis. The biggest difference is that we want to get down to what's called the haploid number. So let me just write some things on the board first before we start moving chromosomes around. All right, so looking at the comparison between mitosis and meiosis, first of all, definition-wise, mitosis is for regular cells, right? All body cells here. So mitosis, remember, is for nuclear division. It's for division of the nucleus of basically all body cells, minus muscle cells and nerve cells, right? For meiosis, it's the sex cells. So that just inherently is the big, big difference. The other difference in mitosis and meiosis is we want genetically identical cells to be divided and produced, you could say, throughout mitosis, right? Genetically identical, so that the one cell that was started in mitosis would divide into two other cells, right, with genetically identical products. In meiosis, we want what? Genetically unique or different cells. The other major difference is in mitosis, we get the products of mitosis are diploid. And what are the products in meiosis? The products are haploid. So haploid is described as what? N. Diploid is described as 2N. So let's talk about what N is first. What is N? That's just the genetic term for 23 chromosomes. So 2N would have to be 2 times that, right? 46. So if you've been up and down this meiotic cycle, um, you know that it can get kind of crazy, right? But you should always start with the fact that you always have 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad in your cells right now, right? All your cells. So when we start meiosis, we start with a diploid cell, but we end up with a haploid cell. When you do mitosis, you start with a diploid cell also, but you stay diploid, okay? So maybe we should write that down. We start diploid in both stages. But the products divide themselves differently in meiosis. Everybody on the same page so far? Okay, it's going to be tough to do with holding this. I'll have to, I guess, put it down at some point. So I'll have to come over here and guess uh, draw out some things. But first of all, let's look at what we get with regular, myos regular mitosis, right? Imagine, just ignore the colors here, but what it really means, the colors, red is from mom, blue is from dad. First of all, how many do I have? Four, right? This is how the book always shows mitosis and meiosis, using basically just four chromosomes. What you should really know is how many there should be to start mitosis, let's say. To start mitosis? There should be 46 of these little L's. I call them little L's. When they're together, I'll call them little X's, right? I just mean the shape. I'm not talking about the X chromosome. 